The next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 10202 in the name of Mary Fee on celebrating Scotland's gypsy traveller community. And the debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Mary Fee to open the debate for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I take this opportunity to welcome members of the Gypsy Traveller community who have travelled from across Scotland to the public gallery for this afternoon's debate. And in addition, I'd like to also thank the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities for her commitment to eradicating all forms of discrimination experienced by the Gypsy Traveller community in Scotland. The Scottish Government's decision to establish a ministerial working group on Gypsy Travellers is an important, positive and a welcome step in the right direction. And I'd also like to thank members from across the Chamber for supporting my motion. I am extremely pleased to have the opportunity this afternoon to celebrate the rich cultural contribution of the Gypsy Traveller community to Scottish society throughout the centuries, as well as to highlight the enduring discriminatory attitudes towards Gypsy Travellers. It's important to state from the outset that the Scottish Gypsy Traveller community is not homogenous. It's a diverse and vibrant community of peoples composed of a variety of distinct groups which each have their own unique culture, histories and traditions. It includes Highland and Lowland Scottish travellers, occupational travellers, Romanicals, Irish travellers, English gypsies and Welsh kale. And some members of the community choose to live a fully nomadic lifestyle and are constantly on the road. Others choose to travel for part of the year and live in traditional brick and mortar homes for the rest of the year. And I am proud that my West Scotland constituency has a tangible connection to the Gypsy Traveller community, who enrich the cultural fabric of my region with two residential sites for Gypsy Travellers located at Denison Forge in Dumbarton and the Redburn site in Irvine. And on the issue of residential sites, I welcome the publication of the Scottish Government's progress report on minimum site standards. However, I am extremely disheartened and disappointed at the lack of progress that has been made in improving the standard of residential gypsy traveller sites across Scotland over the last three years. And the first written evidence of the presence of gypsy travellers in Scotland dates to the late 15th century. However, it's commonly believed that the origins of Scotland's gypsy traveller population can be traced to the Celtic Age. The gypsy traveller community is a tight-knit community which has a strong sense of cultural identity. It's a community with strong oral traditions and through storytelling and singing throughout the centuries, gypsy travellers in Scotland have shared their histories and passed down their trad traditions from generation to generation. And these strong oral traditions have facilitated the continuation of the historic language of the gypsy traveller, Kant. Scottish gypsy travellers have played an important role in contributing to the rich tapestry of our modern national history since the 15th century. However, regrettably, discrimination of the gypsy traveller community remains the last bastion of acceptable racism in Scotland. And since my election to this parliament in 2011, I have continually raised the stubbornly high levels of the discrimination and the range of inequalities experienced by the gypsy traveller community in Scotland. Presiding officer, I'd like to start by telling the chamber a small anecdote of the discrimination which is faced by members of the gypsy traveller community on a daily basis. In the last session of Parliament, when I was convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee, we invited a group of women from the Gypsy Traveller community to an event in the Scottish Parliament. And in the afternoon before coming to Parliament, the women and their children decided to go for some lunch at an Italian restaurant not too far from here on the Royal Mile. They were shown to a seat by a member of the waiting staff. However, before having the opportunity 
to order any food, these gypsy traveller women and their children were asked to leave the restaurant on the request of the manager. The manager stated that he was concerned that the presence of these women in his restaurant would deter other customers from soliciting his restaurant. His prejudice was sparked simply by the way these women were dressed. He judged them to be gypsy travellers and therefore, based on their ethnicity, he refused to serve them and asked them to leave. This is just one stark example of the discrimination and the racism that members of the gypsy traveller community experience every single day. Social attitudes towards gypsy travellers in Scotland remain an area of grave concern. And the recent Scottish Social Attitudes Survey on attitudes to discrimination and positive action revealed that just under one third of Scots would be unhappy if a relative married or formed a long-term relationship with a gypsy traveller. And furthermore, 34% of people believe that a gypsy traveller is unsuitable to be a primary school teacher. And these figures are staggering and should be viewed as simply unacceptable for Scotland in 2018. And, presiding officer, in coming to a close, it's evident that there is still so much work to be done to educate and inform society about the rich contribution that gypsy traveller culture has made to our shared history. There is still much more to do to call out and challenge discrimination and offensive behaviour towards gypsy travellers. And we must commit to meaningful action to protect the gypsy tra travellers community's distinct nomadic way of life and to work to tackle the often blatant and always ill-informed discrimination that's experienced every single day by gypsy travellers across the length and breadth of Scotland. And I look forward to listening to members' contributions to this debate. Thank you. Uh, can I ask those in the public gallery not to clap, boo, hiss or cheer? Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, we move on to the open debate. And speeches of four minutes, please. We're quite tight for time. Christina McKelvey, followed by Annie Wells. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I thank Mary Fee for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and pay personal tribute to her for the work that she has done to keep this issue at the top of the agenda of this place. And also to declare an interest, possibly for both of us, I think, of being honorary members of the Showman's Guild, um, which is a great honour for both of us to hold. Can I commend to the Chamber a lovely document, I have it here, The Gypsy Traveller History in Scotland, written by Seamus McPhee and produced by Iris. Um, a smashing document that will give you um, a real insight and understanding to a thousand years of discrimination in Scotland, some of it by governments. And that's incredibly worrying because it wasn't that long ago. It tells us how the gypsy traveller community was treated in Scotland and shames us all. And Mary Fee talked in her contribution about the first official record, and that is in this document. And I would wish to read it. Considered to be the first official record of gypsies in Scotland and noted in the Book of the Treasurer of the King, James IV, in 1505, a sum of seven pounds is paid to the Egyptians by the King's command. Whether for entertainment or because they are pilgrims carrying out penance remains unclear. So that's one of the very first documented facts. In 1506, Anthony Gavino, who was the Earl of Little Egypt, receives a letter of commendation from the King James to his uncle, the King of Denmark. This assures the gypsies safe passage to Denmark. They are thought to carry a paper, papal order from Rome, urging them some degree of sympathy. We have not moved on much for, from then, presiding officer, and we need to do so, so much more considering some of the issues that we still face are perpetrated by even some elected members. So we've all got something to learn.
And a few weeks ago, I visited, along with the Cabinet Secretary, the South Lanarkshire Council Gypsy Traveller Education Project in Lark Hall. The whole visit organised and run by the young Gypsy Traveller children who are succeeding in all areas of their life, gaining qualifications because of this project. <coughs> it demonstrated very clearly to us the value of doing things a wee bit differently, that we shouldn't expect people to fit into how we do things, we should make things flexible enough for people to, for us in the system to fit into that lifestyle. And it's absolutely amazing to see the work they've done. And I want to pay tribute to Mrs. Bernstein, who is a teacher involved there. She's from Lark Hall Academy and has a whole team working with her, but she was an absolute inspiration and she has changed lives in this project. Some of the things that we have spoken about in the committee, um, Equality and Human Rights Committee over the past uh, few years as well, we've kept a focus on this. But we've not really focused too much on the culture, the songs, the storytelling, the richness of the life that is lived. And in a proclaimer song called Scotland Story, they tell us we are all Scotland's story and we're all worth the same. And we should all be worth the same, irrespective of how we choose to live our lives. And the Cabinet Secretary visited with me a few weeks ago in Lark Hall, and we met a lot of young people and some very articulate young women who wanted to know, and they asked the Cabinet Secretary a straightforward question, how is what you're doing going to make a difference for me? So, Cabinet Secretary, I know that you have your working group and there's other aspects of that. We are now, you're now working with David Donaldson and the Young Gypsy Travellers Assembly in this place, which is a great advance because one of the things Seamus McPhee asked us at our committee last year was, where's the Gypsy Traveller voice in what you are doing? Hopefully we now have that voice and it's a young voice. So Cabinet Secretary, can you tell me in your summing up what you, the, your working group is doing to make that difference so that when I go back to that education project and tell that particular young woman, here's the difference, we're making it for you. Thank you. Annie Wells, followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and to Mary Fee for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today. As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I had the privilege last year of listening to members of the Gypsy Traveller community as part of as part of marking Human Rights Day. And to quote David Donaldson, a member of the Gypsy Traveller community, who gave evidence that day, since the Scottish Parliament's inception, very little has changed. In fact, the situation has remained completely stagnant. To that end, we must see a step change. Scotland's Gypsy Traveller population is estimated to be between 15,000 and 20,000. And despite this, and the fact that the community has lived here in Scotland, since the 12th century, Gypsy Travellers remain one of the most marginalised and isolated communities in Scotland. As Mary Fee also highlighted, the recent social, Scottish Social Attitude Survey suggested that 31% of people would be unhappy or very unhappy about a close relative marrying a Gypsy Traveller, and 34% said that a Gypsy Traveller would be very or fairly unsuitable as a primary school teacher. What these statistics suggest is that discrimination towards this group is still very much accepted, being described as the last bastion of acceptable racism. The impact of this marginalisation is clear and there are obvious boundaries between gypsy travellers and public services. When it comes to health, basic needs are not being met, with many gypsy travellers facing difficulties when trying to visit a GP, and with some travelling as far as 300 miles to see a dentist or doctor they trust and know will see them. And the impact of this is clear. Many Gypsy travellers experience inexcusable health inequalities and lower life expectancies. The age profile of Gypsy travellers is much younger compared to the population as a whole, with only 28% of the population aged 45 and over, as compared with 44% of the population as a whole. And when it comes to, to housing, the accommodation situation for many Gypsy Traveller communities is described as remaining dire. Many local council assigned sites are built in undesirable and unsafe locations, often on unpopular brownfield sites, unsuitable for commercial or residential use. And many sites often experience issues with dampness, mould and access to water. 
and it was good to hear from Christina McKelvey about the great work being done at Lark Hall, because education too must be a priority and we must urgently improve the educational outcomes of young gypsy travellers. I am, of course, extremely pleased that a ministerial working group has been established to improve the lives of gypsy traveller communities. And as the Racial Equality Action Plan states itself, a radical new approach is now needed, something that I wholeheartedly support. Going forward, I would like to see regular reviews of the work being done. Reviews should be open and transparent, and the group should continue to work closely with the travelling community in order to scope policy. To finish today, Deputy President Officer, I'd like to again thank Mary, Mary Fee for bringing this debate to the Chamber. In 2001, we saw the publication of the first committee report on gypsy travellers, and it's clear that a lot more work still needs to be done. From all sides of this chamber, we want to see action on this. Gypsy travellers must always have a right to their traditional way of life, but we must also work with that in improving the lives of those in the community, whether it be housing, health or education. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Call Willie Coffey to be followed by John Finney. Thanks very much, President Officer. Can I also congratulate Mary Fee on bringing this subject to the attention of the Parliament. Mary is a long standing advocate and supporter of the gypsy travelling community, and it's right that we recognise that today. The disadvantage and discrimination experienced by the gypsy traveller community in Scotland is widespread in relation to access to things like housing, healthcare, employment, and educational opportunities. It has been claimed that the discrimination against this community feels like the last acceptable form of racism that has been mentioned already by a few members, as the maltreatment, harassment and community tension suffered by gypsy travellers is far more normalised and accepted than that directed at other ethnic minority groups. To give the Chamber a couple of examples, how, how would members feel if, when they were a child at school and one day received a letter from your teacher informing you that there was no point teaching you as you're just going to end up tarmacking the roads anyway. Or imagine your distress if you were a young man excited at the prospect of contributing to a community planning executive meeting only to be told, here's your first lesson. Nobody cares about the tinks. Can you imagine being made to feel so ashamed of your ethnicity that you don't, you don't tell people about your own background until you've known them well enough to hope that they won't react badly. These are just a few of the shocking experiences which have been relayed by members of the gypsy traveller community of the daily discrimination they face. And I'm saddened to say that these are just a snapshot of the wider problem. Nobody deserves to be made to feel like they are less, especially because of their ethnicity. What should concern us is seeing how reinforced and circular many of these instances are. The lack of sufficient transit sites for travellers usually means they're compelled to stop somewhere that's probably not suitable and brings them into conflict with local, the local community. I know councils have tried to address this and some good work is being done, but it might need a national solution to overcome that particular problem. Poor health is a significant issue within the travelling community, yet they experience great difficulty, as Annie Wells mentioned, in accessing public health services with GPs and dentists, sometimes refusing to even register them as patients. As you can imagine, presiding officer, experiencing this treatment so often in so many areas of life has a devastating impact. Although little Scottish-specific data exists on the health of gypsy travellers, a report by the Equality and Human Rights Commission confirms that the rates of mental ill health in this community are much higher than in the wider population. The closest specific figures we have to hand demonstrate the distressing correlation between inequality and mental health. Suicide amongst Irish travellers in particular was found to be six times the rate of the wider population and a staggering 11% of the community are lost to suicide. Life expectancy is also at an alarmingly low average of only 55 years, as I think may have been mentioned by Mary Fee earlier. President officer, many of us in the Scottish Parliament have shown how the concept of Scottishness is one that is elastic enough to include all and any who wish to live and work in this wonderful country. Indeed, my own great-great-grandfather, Daniel Coffey, came from County Tipperary in Ireland probably around the famine years and settled in Kilmarnock 
and my Irish friends have reminded me constantly of the links I myself have with the travelling community there. Perhaps, sign officer, most of us are migrants if you, if you look back far enough. We've striven in this parliament, parliament to welcome and show our appreciation for the positive contribution that migrants have made in enriching and improving Scottish society. Colleagues have fought against the unjust deportation of those who have made their lives here, and we work together to support a bill offering pardons to gay men with historic convictions. So can our One Scotland, Many Cultures ideal reach out and embrace the travelling community too? I think it can and it must, with a little bit of mutual respect for the differing traditions. Tougher enforcement against gypsy travellers might be the solution for some misguided politicians, but it won't take us one step forward in proclaiming ourselves to be the inclusive society we aspire to be. So thank you once again to my colleague Mary Fee for raising this issue in Parliament, and let's hope that our deeds reflect the positive vision that our words promise to so many of our traveller companions in Scotland. Thank you. John Finney, followed by David Torrance. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I would like to join with colleagues in congratulating Mary Fee on bringing this motion here and recognising her ongoing work and fondly recall our time together on the Equal Opportunities to Commit. When, when people said, what changed? Well, actually, two reports came from that committee in the last session. They used some of the strongest language that I, I understand had been used in, in parliamentary reports. They were done on a consensual cross-party basis and they gave a very clear steer. So, um, if I sound frustrated when I discuss this subject, then it is because I am frustrated. But um, let's try and get some positives to the headed up celebrating Scotland's gypsy traveller community. And I think we'd, we should. Christina McKelvey talked about a proclaimer song there that lists a, a lengthy list of, of groups. But here we're all a mongrel race, and I mean that as the absolute compliment, not in any way of, offensive. Um, and it is a rich... Uh, um, social and cultural contribution that's been made. But it's unknown and it's, it's undervalued. And to many, it's out of sight, out of mind. Now, I, I, I'm very uh, fond of uh, people, uh, advocates for the Gypsy Traveller movement, including the Article 12, who do tremendous work, the, the young woman then. And I had a look at some of the resources. And one of the resources uh, out last year was a, something called Till Doomsday in the Afternoon, Gypsy Travellers in Scotland. And it's a resource that could be part of the curriculum for e excellence and quote, to raise awareness and understanding of the history, culture and traditions of the Scottish Gypsy Traveller and work with young people to identify and seek solutions to key flashpoints that often occur between Gypsy Travellers and the settled community. And um, I think self-identification is very important. People uh, choose to identify themselves um, as they think best fits their circumstances, and it's sadly the case that a number of gypsy travellers choose not to identify themselves as such or give their address for the reason of the discrimination. And the very short time that we have, I, I want to uh, allude to uh, a response I, was, uh, I received from the Cabinet Secretary in relation to a question I posed, I think it was last week, if not the week before, and it was about um, traditional stopping off routes. And I, I was very grateful that for the response I got, and I think it's worthy of putting it on the record. And Cabinet Secretary, the Scottish Government recognised the rights of gypsy travellers community to a travelling lifestyle in that as part of the way of life, tradition and history. <coughs> now, I'm from rural Inverness, and where I was, I, I can remember the, there was two places, one at Mursheerlich. Now, that was in a wooded area. Um, that's now surrounded by a fence with a very large house in it. There was another which was at a roadside near Spean Bridge, and that's uh, again fenced off. And um, got livestock in there. But what I think there's an opportunity, and there was obviously hundreds, if not thousands, across Scotland. I think uh, I've said before, and I say, keep saying again, a lot of sites were uh, stopping off points were stopped off at the time in the New Age Travellers. Now, many of these people are now back doing their merchant banking or other jobs in the City of London. It was a lifestyle choice for a while. But that interfered with our uh, indigenous uh, nomadic population. So I think that there are opportunities there for local authorities, for public bodies, for the roads authority to look at that. And also in relation to the housing needs and demand assessment, and, and I'm grateful for the, the government's report here, like others, I fear there could be a, a lot more uh, could be done. But I want to single out one group um, and among the local authorities, and that's not those who are listed in the report, it's those who are not listed in the report. Because the reality is that the people who have, the local authorities have responsibility directly or indirectly for sites, a lot of them are doing their very best. There are a number of local authorities who've got their heads down doing zero, hee-haw. So what we do need is a more uh, 
collaborative approach. And that should mean that housing needs and demands assessment, and even that term housing is perhaps unhelpful, um, should be on a collaborative uh, uh, cross-boundary um, uh, basis, because that's the way we'll, we'll, we'll uh, progress that particular issue. No one is born prejudiced. Um, uh, education is the key to this. So I'm grateful for all the work that's taking place, and I hope we see some positive results in the near future. Thank you. David Torrance, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to thank Mary Fee for bringing this motion to Chamber today to celebrate Scotland's Gypsy Traveller community. And I know it's a subject that's very close to our heart. Gypsy travellers make up a unique part of Scotland's population. They speak a wide range of languages and hold a unique cultural traditions that are passed down from generation to generation. In the 2011 census, 4,200 people identified themselves as Gypsy Travellers. But charities and organisations who work closely with the Gypsy community believe that this is vastly underestimated and instead believe that the community comprises of up to 20,000 people. Regardless of their numbers, Gypsy Travellers have a deeply embedded history in Scotland thought to go back to the 12th century. During my time on the Public Petitions Committee in the last parliamentary session, we heard evidence from Jess Smith, a Scottish Gypsy Traveller who launched a petition to call for the Scottish Government to support the restoration and preservation of the heart of courts overlooking Loch Fyne and Argyll and Butte. These ancient stones, locally referred to as the Tinker's Heart, was often used for marriages, ceremonies and christenings by Gypsy travellers. Although its origins are unconfirmed, one account indicates that the heart was created by Gypsy travel women to commemorate the lives lost during the Jacobite Rising of 1745. However, the ancient site had been under threat for several decades. In 1928, the Tinker's Heart was covered up by workmen from local council during, road, during roadworks, but following local pr protests from landowners and gypsy travellers, the heart was restored. In 2008, a post and wire that surrounded the heart was damaged, thus inspiring Scottish traveller Jess Smith to launch a petition to protect and restore the site, as well as calling it for its listing. A wave of support from the local community to landlords to local council and the parliament indicates the increased recognition of the importance of preserving a unique part of history and culture. The Tinker's Heart is the only existing monument, monument that Scottish travellers have, and although not a big site, remains for crucial historical, religious and cultural significance. Given the very prominent discrimination against Gypsy travellers, it's crucial that this site, as well as the Gypsy travel history, history and culture, remains appreciated. The Public Petitions Committee will work closely with Jess, and I am extremely proud of the outcome of the petition. Jess fought extremely hard to protect the site, leading to a public consultation in 2015, which eventually led to the site being added to a schedule of monuments by Historic Environment Scotland. Jess was subsequently nominated for the Scottish Heritage Angel Award in 2017 in recognition of her work to safeguard the Tinker's Heart and has since published several novels detailing her fight for the Tinker's Heart. The committee visited the site of the Tinker's Heart on the hills overlooking Loch Fyne and my last memory of Jess will always be from that day. We were both leaning over the fence which surrounds the site. It was a stunning day, the sky was clear and you could see for miles she had the biggest smile on her face, and you could see the utter joy and pride radiate from her as we dis discussed the significance of the heart. The site is integral to Scottish history, and it was evident just how much a heart meant to her to know that such a vital part of her culture had been saved for future generations to enjoy clearly meant so much. While statutes may slowly be changing, we still have se several issues to tackle. Large numbers of people within the travelling community continue to face daily struggles with accommodation, eviction, discrimination and harassment, and all too often the threat of abuse or violence is never too far away. The evidence heard by the Equalities Committee also highlighted the fear that surrounds openly identifying as a gypsy or traveller. Added to, to this the lack of suitable residential sites, many are of poor quality and poorly located, it is easy to see the many barriers to integration that exist. We are at a crucial point in which we have to, the capacity to improve the lives of a portion of the Scottish population who are struggling with employment, education and healthcare. Moving forward, we need to further understand the needs of these communities in order to begin to tackle the many faces of discrimination. I'd once again like to thank Mary Buffy for bringing this motion to the Chamber today and reiterate the importance of understanding and appreciating Scotland's rich cultural history and the relationship between the land and its people. Jamie Green to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, without sounding overly gushing, I too would like to thank Mary Fee. Uh, I know this is an issue which is very close to Mary's heart and actually she's been 
uh, very uh, fundamental in helping other members of this parliament uh, from different parts of Scotland actually understand uh, uh, the issues around uh, fa uh, facing this community. Um, I know she's working very hard uh, on this issue and I I'd like to think we all uh, support her in that work. Um, a, a lot of the statistics I was going to mention have, have been mentioned already around the, the prejudice and attitudes in Scotland, but I, I would like to point to uh, uh, the recent um, Anas Anwar event around No Problem Here, Racism in Scotland, which really was a collection of, uh, 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 in many ways, of academic essays around the, the, the situation in, uh, in Scotland around prejudice and discrimination. Um, it really concluded that uh, we have a tendency in this country to sweep discrimination prejudice under the rug which often distorts our understanding of its existence. Saying we're an open, uh, modern, liberal country is not the same as, as being one. Um, I also would like to pay particular attention to an essay by uh, Colin Clark, and I would, would commend it to members. It noted that discrimination was particularly evident uh, in the labor market, education, housing, and also in the transport sectors uh, as well. When I was a member of the Human Rights and Equalities Committee, uh, as, as others have mentioned, we, we took a lot of evidence uh, from the community. David, David Donaldson has been mentioned a few times already, uh, but I was quite struck by the evidence that, that he gave. He talked about, uh, in his peer group, being the only person that he knew that went to, had gone to university. Now, if we know that uh, the estimates uh, put uh, the gypsy traveler community to be in the tens of thousands in Scotland, and he is a, an advocate in that group and a, and a well-known one at that, and he, if he says he's the only person that he knows that's gone to university, then surely there is a problem uh, there. That's not representative of, of wider society. I was very moved uh, by the evidence that we heard. And I think if, if we use that sort of language, the language that people use around the gypsy travel community, if that was directed, for example, at the Jewish community or the LGBT community or other BME communities, there would be absolute public outcry over it. So it is right that people say that it is the last socially acceptable form of racism in Scotland and probably in Western Europe. Uh, in my own region, the west of Scotland, which I share with Mary Fee, I think good work has been done. I know that my local area, North Ayrshire Council, have taken steps and measures to work and engage with the community. The site in Irvine is a, is a good example of that, but that doesn't mean things are perfect. Um, there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of bad practice uh, with throughout uh, other parts of Scotland. Uh, I, I would uh, uh, make an open invitation if, if members of the communities uh, in Irvine or Dumbarton uh, uh, wish to uh, uh, see me, I would absolutely love to come and visit and hear about some of the day-to-day -day issues that they're probably facing. Um, there are problems in areas. That I think we'd be remiss to have this debate without uh, talking about that. But there's poor behaviour uh, in every community, uh, in the settled community. Um, it's not limited to one set of society or another. There are people who don't respect the environment or their neighbours throughout Scotland. We had a debate on housing yesterday and the conditions that people live in. So I think to, to stereotype uh, uh, is wrong. There are so many myths out there about this community. Now, I think perhaps reality TV has played a part in some of that. I don't think that's been particularly helpful. It's, it's, it's stereotyping and, and turning this into entertainment. It's not entertaining for people who are afraid to go to school for being bullied or, or, or even teachers uh, who can't get work because of their, uh, in, uh, their ethnicity. Uh, so more can be done. I think prejudice, uh, I think as someone else said, is born out of fear and a lack of understanding. And I think as humans, we are intrinsically afraid of things that we don't understand, cultures and customs and traditions and languages that we don't understand and we don't share. So education really, I think, will be key. I know we're short on time today, so I, I will close by making a plea. Uh, there is a working group, uh, uh, but I've also, I get the impression, having only been in this place a few years, uh, that a lot of this discussion has already happened. Uh, and commitments have already been made. Promises have been made in the past. And I think the last thing, and it's not for me to be their voice today, but I think the last thing the gypsy travel community wants is more empty promises and more warm words from politicians. They want to see action, and any action that is delivered, I will be fully supportive of. Thank you. Uh, the last of the open debate speakers is Monica Lennon. Thank you, presiding officer. Like others, I would also like to thank Mary Fee for securing this important debate and for being a strong voice for the Gypsy Traveller community since she was elected to the Parliament in 2011. So thank you to Mary. It is to Scotland's shame that, despite their positive contribution to society, the Gypsy Traveller community continues to experience appalling discrimination. Their experience of prejudice has been described as the last acceptable form of racism. A person's first experience of discrimination sadly often occurs in childhood. At an evidence session in December last year, 
the Equalities and Human Rights Committee heard from a member of the Gypsy Traveller community who described being treated like an animal by his teachers at school. And we've heard that this discrimination follows Gypsy Travellers into adulthood. As Mary Fee highlighted from the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey, we know that over one third of Scots believe that Gypsy Travellers shouldn't be educating our children. That's why the work that Christina McKelvey has highlighted today about her constituents in, in Lark Hall is so import, important because in this year of young people, it's absolutely important that we use education to break down barriers. And I think the work that Mrs Bernstein and her colleagues and the students are doing is absolutely wonderful. And it's great to see so many young people in the gallery today. My... Um, own contact with members of the Gypsy Traveller community is largely within my work as a town planner before, uh, that was my job before I became a politician. And we know from other speeches today that there's uh, a severe lack of, of housing sites for the Gypsy Traveller community. Several years ago, I worked closely with one particular family who owned their own land and for decades had been using that uh, as, a, as a pitch for, for caravans. And I won't go into all the technical aspects of it, but eventually when they approached the council to have that formalised, they were told that they couldn't get a certificate of lawfulness and that, in fact, an enforcement notice had been served on the site many years ago. But when we asked to see the records of that, the records hadn't been kept. And despite a body of evidence, and I was thinking about this last night because it was very emotional at the time, I was able to produce, with the family's assistance, um, death certificates that were um, shown the address was this particular site. Uh, medical uh, letters from GPs, letters from social workers, letters of support from an MSP, a counsellor, the family's neighbours and friends, showing that they were very much part of the community and this was their home. And despite all of that, the application was refused and eventually there was an appeal to the Scottish Government and that, that appeal was successful. That site was in North Lanarkshire, which is now part of the region where I am an MSP. But looking at the council's um, figures on Gypsy Traveller housing provision, it hasn't got any better. And the sites that were closed a number of years ago remain closed and new sites haven't opened. So um, I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary is in her place. I know her, her commitment to equalities, but I wonder in, in her closing the marks if she'll say something about the planning bill, because there's a big opportunity to include gypsy travellers in the heart of what we're doing with the planning system. I still don't feel entirely confident that, that we're getting there, but I think today the fact that we're having this debate allows us to, to keep these issues on the top of the agenda and uh, you know, I think that we, we can make progress, but in terms of the sites that, that we do have, they're, they're you know, still not meeting the standards of the Scottish Housing Regulator. More needs to be done about that. But we do need to respect the different wishes of the diversity of the gypsy traveller community. And for those who wish to have their own sites and own their own land, we have to accommodate that through the housing needs demand assessment process and through planning. And uh, I'm grateful that I've been able to take part in this short debate today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I ask the Cabinet Secretary to respond, if we want to hear a response to a lot of time, I'm going to have to extend the debate a little. <laughs> so um, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes, with the assurance that she won't speak for 30 minutes. <laughs> the question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Yes, that. Oh, sorry, I should have asked Ms. Fee yeah. to move it first. Moved. Moved from a Thank second you. position. Okay, rewind. <laughs> the question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's therefore agreed. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Today we have in the public gallery members of our Gypsy Traveller community who are from Aberdeen, Angus, Aviemore, Clydebank, West Lothian and of course we have representation uh, from the Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly uh, and that includes uh, Mr uh, Davy Donaldson also uh, as well as the indefatigable uh, Mrs B, Mrs Bernstein from the uh, Lark Hall uh, Gypsy Traveller Education uh, Programme. 
So firstly, can I uh, welcome our guests to the Scottish Parliament today uh, and say that this is your Parliament. You have absolutely every right to be here and you have the right to expect the very best, the absolute best of representation from your parliamentarians. Because we're here to do a job, we're here to represent all of Scotland, and that includes uh, the gypsy traveller community and all its diversity as well. I too, President Officer, want to congratulate Mary Fee uh, on securing this debate. Uh, as has been repeated by many uh, members this afternoon, Mary has been a passionate champion for the Scottish Gypsy Traveller community uh, for many, uh, many years. And I'm really uh, genuinely looking forward uh, to the, the cross-party working group uh, that she's going to lead and establish uh, in uh, the near future, because I think it's very important that there is uh, a cross-party uh, working group uh, that is there to support and uh, uh, proclaim the voice uh, of the community and that that group is there to work alongside uh, the ministerial uh, working group as well. But her motion, uh, the start of her motion rightly starts with the social and cultural uh, contribution of the Gypsy Traveller community. And we've heard from Christina McKelvey, we've heard from Willie Coffey and David Torrance that this is a community that's very much part and parcel of Scotland's story. And this is a community that care deeply about the heritage and history of our country and they care deeply uh, about the land. And like others, uh, I want to celebrate the contribution which Gypsy Traveller Heritage makes to the cultural life of Scotland. And I am delighted that next month sees the launch of an annual celebration of Gypsy uh, Roma Traveller History Month uh, in Scotland. Because I think John Finney also touched on a very important point that that contribution, that cultural heritage, that history um, is largely unknown. And we should, of course, uh, be shining a light on a history that we should all be very proud of. And then by doing so, I also hope that this will play a part in challenging uh, stereotypes and reducing uh, the discrimination that this community faces uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Because it is true that the Gypsy Traveller community in Scotland continue to face intolerable levels of prejudice and intolerable levels of hostility. And this absolutely has to change. I know there has been a lot of talk and insufficient action and that we've had three parliamentary inquiries and while there has been some progress it would be unfair not to pay tribute to that progress but it has been patchy and it's been inconsistent and frankly it has not been good enough so that's why I have established the ministerial working group which it brings together ministers with responsibility for housing education employment and health the ministerial working group which I chair will develop and drive forward uh, radical new approaches uh, across uh, government and bring together uh, real change at a much faster pace. But I have to stress, we are not doing this in splendid isolation. We're not doing this in an office or a cupboard, you know, somewhere in this parliament or indeed down at St Andrew's House. Uh, we will publish the minutes of that uh, working group. Uh, we will keep committee and parliament fully informed. Uh, we uh, invite uh, guests uh, to take part in the ministerial working group. We have particular themed um, discussions. But over and above that, it's also the work that goes on out with uh, that working group. So the engagement that I've had, uh, whether it's with the uh, Scottish Travellers Education Programme, uh, whether it's the, the visit to uh, Lark Hall, or yesterday to visit a site on Reading Industrial Estate in Falkirk, or the contact I've had uh, with MECOP, or indeed the contact that I expect other ministers right across government uh, to be having uh, with stakeholder organisations and indeed uh, individual uh, members of the community. And I know a number uh, of my colleagues have had the pleasure of meeting with the Gypsy Traveller uh, Youth Assembly as well. But the important point about the ministerial uh, working group, and this touches on a point of partnership working uh, with, with COSLA, and I met with uh, COSLA uh, this morning and I've been hearing about the work uh, that they're doing uh, you know, across local government to really tap into local leadership. Because we need local champions uh, to be really standing up in council chambers 
and actually facing down and calling down discrimination uh, whenever and wherever uh, they, they, they receive it. So when I met with uh, Councillor uh, Whitham this morning, uh, who's the Community and Wellbeing uh, Chairperson, she chairs the, the COSLA uh, Wellbeing Board. Uh, she was able to you know, appraise uh, me of the, the uh, paper that the COSLA have produced, the engagement that they've also had uh, with Mr uh, Donaldson and actually some of the very pragmatic um, potential solutions that they're prepared uh, to look at. But deeper than that, I also think it is crucial that in terms of the two spheres of government in Scotland, whether it's Scottish government uh, and local government, that we do uh, work together, challenge uh, each other, but that we find ways to actively demonstrate uh, in terms of improving uh, the lives uh, of members of the Gypsy Traveller community that we actively uh, find ways to demonstrate that we are taking uh, a human rights approach. And that's a conversation uh, that we've started uh, to have uh, with each other because for me, uh, human rights are at the core of everything that we do, but it's how we implement them and it's how they make a difference out there uh, with real people in real communities uh, and to the people uh, that, that we, we serve. So, you know, and I want to say to uh, Jamie Green um, in particular, I take very seriously that there's been a number um, of, of inquiries and the last thing, the absolutely last thing uh, I would ever uh, want to be involved in um, is, you know, uh, having people feel that, that, that level uh, of disengagement that they've heard all this before. And I want, uh, with the support of this parliament uh, and across party bases for the message fallen from this debate, is that we are absolutely serious. And I'll take Jamie uh, Green at his word uh, for his support, that when we may indeed, you know, either, either at a local or national level, have to make very uh, difficult decisions, that we will do so with the support of this parliament and that we'll go forward uh, as one uh, making a difference. Now, I know many of uh, the, the speakers have touched on the Scottish Social uh, Attitudes Survey. Uh, indeed, it is uh, a wake-up uh, call. And what we really have to, to recognise is that that uh, fear of discrimination uh, and that real discrimination uh, prevents the gypsy traveller community from accessing essential public services that they have every right uh, to access. And that in turn contributes and exacerbates uh, the, the poor outcomes that they experience. So therefore, our public services need that greater awareness uh, of culture, uh, need that greater awareness of the needs uh, of the community. And we need to help ensure that right across the public uh, sector uh, that we are better equipped to understand uh, and respond uh, to the needs uh, of the community. And I hope it goes without saying that we do not tolerate uh, any other forms uh, of racist abuse or insidious discrimination and so we must all challenge discrimination in all its forms uh, towards the gypsy traveller community uh, whenever and wherever it uh, exists. I'll just uh, quickly say, uh, presiding officer, that uh, when it came to the, the site standards, uh, site standards are minimum site standards, uh, and I share that disappointing that the, the, the minimum uh, site standards uh, have not been universally met uh, across all the uh, sites uh, in, in, in Scotland. Uh, and I uh, want to uh, say very clearly uh, to Parliament that this government was very proactive in, in, in publishing uh, that report, uh, very proactive in clearly stating what our position was in that report. Uh, we will not demur when there are difficulties. We won't turn the other way when things fall below an acceptable standard. And we will not uh, sweep any issue uh, under the carpet. So therefore, uh, we have written to every local authority and social landlord site uh, provider, uh, making clear that we expect improvements to be made as soon as possible. And the Scottish Housing Regulator uh, has a statutory role in this and must play a part and ensuring that social landlords meet the standards uh, which are now uh, part of the Scottish Social Housing Charter and that all site providers uh, maintain their sites to these standards uh, and I also expect site providers to work with the residents to keep them informed uh, of progress uh, as well. Now I know there are many issues in and around housing needs uh, uh, assessments, uh, there are issues about lack of provision, uh, there is uh, issues about the types uh, of provision 
uh, that is available. Uh, work that we are actively looking at uh, is around traditional uh, halting stops. Mr Stewart, the Housing Minister, is a particular interest in, in halting stops. Uh, and I also know that Mr Donaldson um, and his work uh, with COSLA has uh, pointed to some really good and innovative practice um, in Leeds around negotiated uh, stopping uh, uh, points as well. Um, and that, you know, is really interesting work that should, we should be looking uh, at uh, very carefully. And quite clearly, uh, there is much more work to do both uh, in health and education. And the key thing uh, for me is that our services uh, are able to reach out uh, when they should be reaching out and that we provide flexible services that provide uh, opportunities uh, for the Gypsy Traveller community to take part in without fear uh, of disadvantage or uh, discrimination. And I know I'm probably really stretching the patience of, of the presiding officer, but I will just point to uh, our new commitment in the child poverty uh, delivery plan uh, to invest an initial uh, half a million pounds to work directly uh, with the community, with families and other partners uh, to create a more tailored approach, uh, in particular uh, to the early years and early uh, education uh, programmes. Presiding officer, there, uh, I appreciate there are many questions perhaps in and around uh, planning that I've not uh, went into. Of course, there's a, a stage one uh, debate on planning next week. So I hope members uh, take that opportunity here because the debate about how we work with the Gypsy Traveller community uh, to improve uh, their lives and their opportunities and to really take to heart uh, their voices isn't just one for a member's debate, important though a member's debate is, it has to be uh, at the heart of every debate that we have uh, in this par parliament. So I hope uh, the members will indeed take the opportunity uh, to talk and reflect about the needs of the Gypsy Traveller uh, community. So thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I'm really grateful to uh, all members uh, who have uh, participated uh, in the, this afternoon's uh, debate. I thank members uh, for all their individual uh, contributions. Uh, it is imperative uh, that we shine a light on what John Finney describes as the sheer and utter frustration, but also uh, what Willie Coffey talked about in that need to go forward uh, as one Scotland and ensuring uh, that the Gypsy Traveller community, who we represent, can live happier, healthier, wealthier lives where they can play their full role uh, in the next stage of Scotland's story. Thank you. That concludes the debate and the meeting is suspended until half past two. Now that the meeting's closed, can I just say well done everyone, that was an excellent debate and I'm sure those in the public gallery would agree with